And it's blazing like a fire that nothing can contain. Your love is louder than my fears, and it's breaking chains in me. It's setting my heart free. Come on, you guys know this song. Let's sing it out. So I shout, shout. to be loud This love is meant to be Everybody, welcome. Welcome to Chapel Hill today. And everybody watching online, thanks for tuning in. We're so glad all of you are here. I'm Pastor Dave. The psalmist said in Psalm 122, 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And better is one day in his house than a thousand elsewhere. So glad you came to his house today. Come on, we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing a new song, teach you a new song. Let, let's pray together. Lord, we're just so grateful that we can come to your house, and we can just be with one another, and we can sing songs that are just, just lifts up your name. And we just pray, Lord Jesus, you'd be glorified through the singing, through the word, and just do what you want to do in our hearts today in Jesus' name. And everybody said a big amen. amen. All right, here we go, a brand new song.
is an open door. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now. has been enough that's truth this morning and I'm believing the best is yet to come the cross before me my hope on things above and in you Jesus the best is yet to come your prayer is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now. are possible for you, Lord, that if you go before against us, nothing can stand against us, Lord, because you are on our side, and that's why we sing this this morning, and I know breakthrough is coming, by faith I see a miracle, my God made me a promise and it won't stop now, and I We thank you for your presence in this place, God. You are our refuge, our strength. Lord, we put our hope and our trust in you. A firm foundation, God. Sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. we could ever breathe we live for you come on you know it let's sing Jesus the name above all names mm. Jesus the name above yes praise your name Jesus 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, oh, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Come on, with one voice, we sing holy, 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 there is no one like you, there is none beside. sing a word.
We serve a great God. We serve a great God. Father, we thank you that you are a good, good Father, but you are a great, great God. There is nothing impossible for you. There is nothing too hard for you. When we put our trust in you, we exalt your holy name, the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome. It's great to be in the house of God. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Listen, before you're seated, why don't you give somebody around you, just give them a high five or a handshake and uh, tell them it is good we are here. You can have a seat. Man, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. And it's good to see his house full. I'm glad all you are here. My name is Matt Schaefer. I'm the small groups pastor here at Chapel Hill. And uh, we are so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. You could have been anywhere and you chose to be here and that honors us. And so we're pleased that you're here. We would love to get to know you, uh, maybe help you get further connected to our church. And you could do that simply by reaching out to the seat pocket in front of you and picking up one of these blue cards. It's a connect card. And if you'll give us just a little bit of your information, this week we'd like to send something your way that'll help us get to know you, but it'll also help you find ways to make meaningful connections here at our church. And so if you fill out that card, you can do two things with it. One, we got a free gift for you if you take it to the hospitality room as you leave today. We, some of our team's gonna be back there. We'd love to get to meet you and just give you a little gift that just says, thank you for coming. Or you can hold on to it and at the end of our giving, uh, at the end of our worship experience today during our time of giving, we're gonna pass our giving containers and you can just place it in there uh, as they pass those giving containers. And so now let's get ready to lean in. So grab, in, grab your Bibles, grab whatever you use to take notes, and let's get ready as Pastor Dave comes to bring us a word of encouragement as we continue our message series, I Have Needs. to see all of you here today and welcome if again if you're watching online first Peter is where we're going first Peter chapter 4 so if you have your Bibles get ready uh, get your notepad your iPad whatever you're taking notes on and uh, let's get ready to just open our hearts and receive 
uh, the word of the Lord today. Before I get there, I uh, just want to remind you that next Saturday is the day. Next Saturday is a special day where, where churches all over the Atlanta metro area, where hundreds of churches are partnering together to go to Stone Mountain for this one race movement event. And we're just going to go and invite you to come with us uh, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturday. And it's going to be a day of just celebration of, of diversity and praying together and worshiping together. There's going to be Christian artists that are there leading in worship. So you can go for a few hours or all day next Saturday. We will not be having our Saturday worship experience next Saturday because of this event. Our staff will all be at Stone Mountain. And then we're just encouraging people to all be here on Sunday together um, as we continue our series, I Have Needs. So that's, that's next week. I love the picture of the wagons, the wagon trains, and and th they used to carry the the early settlers as they migrated west. Now this picture we have in front of you is not the best quality because back then the the, the cameras on their phones were just not near as good as they are today. So so we just just it's not the greatest cl clear picture. But I love the thought of how they would travel in community and they would move from one place to the next in community. And they had this phrase that that's interesting entitled circle the wagons. And you, some of you are familiar familiar with that and there's kind of a photograph of what that meant. It literally means that I'm not in this alone. I've got other people with me and at the end of the day they would circle their wagons because they were a community and they were united in purpose and they would move from this straight line of wagons into a circle. And this just represented their commitment to one another and it also obviously was a maneuver that protected them from outside danger. And you could see how circling the wagons would certainly do that. Our, our United States military do the same type of things with their vehicles. All of our active military uh, uh, people as they're out um, protecting America, they would come and they would, they would circle their vehicles. Here's the, here's the message. There are needs that can be met in a circle that cannot be met in a straight line. You have needs. I have needs. When you come on the weekend and you come and you sit in a straight line, there are needs that can be met in a straight line. However, I would dare say that there are needs that cannot be met in your life as you sit here in a straight line. There are needs of love and belonging and relationship with people that do not fully get met when you're sitting in a straight line, but they can get met when you're sitting in a circle. For instance, just a moment, Pastor Matt uh, gave you an opportunity to have relational connection at, at, at the only level really you're going to get it as it's instructed by us today, and that is turn around, give somebody a high five, and then you can be seated. So you, you might have touched a hand and said high five, and that was like, okay, that's it today, unless you're intentional to go to the commons area after worship experience and sit down with somebody with a cup of coffee and have an exchange across the table, or you gather people together and you are intentional about doing that. But the reality is a lot of us are not intentional on the weekend to do that, we come and sit in a straight line and we worship and we receive the word and we have needs met, but we're not really that intentional to meet the need of love and belonging that we all have. And so, so is everybody with me? So that's where we're starting from. We've showed you in this series that when Abraham Maslow studied human need in the early 1940s, he proposed that healthy people have certain categories of needs and these needs are arranged in a hierarchy. And so we're moving up this hierarchy triangle in our series. And two weeks ago, we talked about physical needs or physiological needs that, that Maslow said and identified. And this is truth. People all have these needs. Uh, then last week, we talked about the need for protection and safety. And let me just say, if you worry about your kids' safety or protection, go back and listen to that message last week because I taught from God's word and the Bible clearly tells us that it's the Lord that is our protector. And yes, we want to use wisdom with our kids and our families, but it's the Lord that is our protector and he provides safety. Today, we're talking about love and belonging. Next week, esteem or this, this sense of our, how, how valuable are we and this sense of, of self-worth that really it doesn't come from self, but it comes from God. And then the last week, it's a really important message as we get to the top of the hierarchy triangle. Paul, Paul said this, he said, in the midst of all these things that I face, he said, my God will supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I, that's, a, that's a promise for you. That's a promise for me. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't memorized that, to memorize it. Say it throughout the day. I call it the promise of 419. The promise of 419 says, and my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You say, well, it says, it says your need. Well, 
my need, my need. And I want you to say that once you personalize it. I want you to lay hold of that promise because God is the provider of all of our needs. So today, I want us to go and talk about how God meets our needs of love and belonging. And how does he do that? He does that through, through Christ-centered, loving, meaningful relationships. And that's just something that's so important for us to not only understand, but for us to be intentional about. I want to teach from this passage in 1 Peter. But first, let me give you the background of when, what was happening in that day when Peter writes this message to the early Christians. By A.D. 60, the number of Christians had increased Dramatically. Now, why was that? Because this was the first generation of the church. There were still eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, how many of you know when you see it firsthand, you're going to tell somebody. And the message was being proclaimed far and wide. People were becoming followers of Jesus in dramatic, rapid numbers. But also, there was also a rise, and that was a rise in the ungodly influence of the Romans. And it was intensifying, and persecution was exploding, especially just after Rome burned. Rome burned, in, you, some of you history buffs know, in AD 64, Rome burned for three days. And some people, some historians believe that Nero could not escape the charge that the fire had been caused by his orders. So Nero, they think, turned the accusation against the Christians. And so from then on, the Christian's life at that time was in peril from Nero and Rome. And so it was in the face of these challenges that Peter calls the church. And he writes this letter and he calls the church to faith and calls the church to hope and courage and just to endure. Be faithful together. And so they had these great needs in the church. And this great need that Peter's pointing out to in this passage here in 1 Peter is this need of belonging and caring for one another and being in intimate community. And so that's where we're starting here in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. So if you have, have your Bibles, look at it with me and we're going to walk through these few verses together. The first thing I want to point out is in, in verse 7 where Peter says, the end of all things is near. The end of all things is near. And I think that this could be a dual prophetic message right here as Peter is saying, the end of all things is near. near. Peter could be saying, we won't escape the persecution of the Romans. The end is near. But I think he's also saying the end of all things is near in light of God's eternal timeline. The end of all things is near. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we're that much nearer to the end on God's eternal timeline. And Peter says, therefore, be alert and be sober so that you may, have, so that you may pray. Have a sober, sober mind. Be clear. Be alert so you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So three things I want to point out to you, and I would encourage you to take some notes and lean in here. First, Peter tells you that God meets your relational needs by giving you a healthy mind. God will give us a healthy mind, and his word instructs how to have a clear and a healthy mind. Nero and the wicked Roman government, they had gone wild. The persecution had intensified. The heat was turned way up. And so Peter is emphasizing the importance of Christians, followers of Jesus, establishing close relational bonds with other believers of sincere faith. In fact, I want you to write this down or at least say it out loud with me right here, if you would. Healthy connections with healthy Christian believers is a key to having a healthy mind and a healthy life. Let's say that again. Healthy connections with healthy Christian believers is a key to having a healthy mind and a healthy life. What word is repeated there several times? Healthy, healthy. God wants us to be whole. We talked about the first week of the series. He wants us to live in wholeness, live healthy. 1 Peter 4, 7, so it says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, have a healthy mind so that you can pray. Now, notice the word therefore in that verse. Therefore, what's it there for? Therefore, well, the world is getting crazy. The end is near. Therefore, therefore, guard yourself from the craziness of the world that's going on, that's outside of the, the, the realm of a relationship with God, all this stuff that's out there. Guard yourself from the craziness by doing this. Be sober and alert. 
be sober-minded and alert. Now, this phrase comes from the Greek word that means to be self-controlled, to curb the controlling influences of emotions, going rogue. How many of you know sometimes the emotions can just go? Anybody lately? The emotions have just gone rogue on you. How many of you know we need truth spoken to our, emotion, our emotions? I mean, when you love somebody and care for someone, then you will learn how to speak truth to the emotional response and outbursts that sometimes people have. So we need truth spoken to the emotions. And, and it also means here to make sure that the voices in your thought life and those voices that you're listening to are grounded in wisdom. So if you're going to have a healthy mind and you're going to be self-controlled and you're going to live sober, you need to make sure you're listening to the right voices and that those voices that you're listening to are grounded in wisdom. So this is my modern day breakdown of this verse. The world is getting crazier, so make sure you are thinking right and thinking clearly through it all. We need to have a clear mind. We need to have voices that are speaking into us. And you've said, I need that. I need that. So today I'm going to go to Chapel Hill and I'm going to worship. And I'm going to sit for, for 35, 40 minutes and I'm going to listen to teaching that from, from a person that I believe has a clear mind and will give me some clear thinking and help me to see things and hear things that I need to hear. I, I hope you trust me and trust those who stand here enough to say that's a voice that I need speaking into my life and because I believe that would give me clarity in thinking and thought and I believe God is leading that. Is, is that what you're saying by being here? I hope so. I hope you trust us. And, it, and so we take, we take this, I take this uh, responsibility at the highest possible level. My wife can tell you it, it, in the way we prepare and I prepare for this is that I know what I say carries weight. Whether you receive it or not, I know that it carries weight. And I know many people are saying, I need to do that. Well, if you're going to do what is said here, we need to make sure we're saying what we believe God has said for us to say. So I just... I'm not sure why I needed to say all that. So as a follower of Jesus, Peter says, right thinking moves us to prayer. Be alert and of sober mind because it leads you to pray. Here's another thought you can write down. Healthy thoughts are thoughts that move you to prayer. If you have healthy, th if you have healthy thinking and healthy voices speaking into your life, they're going to move you, move you to pray. If you have people speaking into your life and people saying things to you and it's moving you further away from prayer... Those are, those are the wrong voices to be listening to. You, wanna, you want voices speaking into you that are moving you to prayer. So relational health begins with a healthy, sober mind. And if you connect, and this is, this is a, a big idea today that I want you to hear. If you connect to a small group, a Chapel Hill small group, a, a small group of other sincere believers, you will have people that will love you, that will encourage you. And those will be the kind of voices that will lead you to clear-mindedness to self-control, and to prayer. Now, here at Chapel Hill, we're, we, we made this available to you. Last week, we talked about it. This week, maybe it's a life group or an interest group or a support group or a men's group or a women's group or one of our Women of Valor groups that are going to be made available next year as we get all these amazing women trained for discipleship. Maybe it's a young adults group. Maybe it's a student group, a ministry group, an Espanol group. we got two Spanish groups that are, that are meeting in, in, this, in this season. Uh, maybe, maybe you are, and I really love to see this, maybe Wednesday night is the only time that you have available and you come to our prayer service and that's wonderful. Maybe you're intentional about gathering a few people at one of the tables in the commons area and you sit with there with a smoothie or, or a cup of coffee. A cup of coffee is really important if you're going to have a small group. Uh, so you sit there and you just share life together on a weekly basis and you're just really intentional about doing that. So maybe that's the beginning of your small group. And so there's lots of opportunities for us to gather in circles because gathering in circles contribute to having a healthy mind and it leads us to prayer. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 7. Secondly, God meets your relational needs by providing authentic relationships. Authentic relationships. We need relationships that are whatever things are true and honest, pure, just, lovely, good report, 
Those things where we'll be able to hear thoughts and hear things from people that are sharing from their heart. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. I'm just going to say I'm going to raise your expectation level for this section of the message because I think this section of the message is just so rich and so important for what, what we need to be doing here. So this is not the time to doze off, go ahead and poke somebody if next to you say, no, you got to get this. This is not the time to be someplace else on your phone. If you don't have the, 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 the scriptures pulled up or if you're not taking notes on your phone or if you're not videoing me right now, then put your phone away. Not that you should, but not that you should video me, but, but no matter what you're doing, just listen, listen, listen. And Peter says this, he says, above all. So he's saying, okay, this is the part you got to get above all. For point of emphasis, he says, love each other deeply. Love each other deeply. The word deeply here means constant, earnest, marked by care and persistent effort, and at times even strained. So when you love each other deeply, there are times even that the relationship will be strained. And he's saying that's not necessarily a bad thing. Thing. In fact, here's what I want you to hear. When we will stay in relationships because our deep love for people, we will grow through the strain. I say a lot of times it's the hard that makes it great, but it's the strain that makes it grow. It's the strain that makes it grow. It's when things are just, it's just hard. Deep relationships sometimes experience strain, but, they, but we endure the strain and we grow through the strain. Learning to grow through, through the strain of relationships may be one of the greatest relationship skills you'll ever possess. I've got to grow through the strain. And I think maybe marriage is one of the greatest examples of this. Today, Cindy and I celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. Today. 40 years. 40 years today. We have had 37 wonderful years of marriage. Three of them were a little strained, and they weren't necessarily back to back to back. We're just, I'm, I don't know. I'm just saying in those 40 years, I'm sure you add up all the days where there was strain, there was probably three years worth. But, but it's been wonderful. And I can tell you we're stronger because of the, the staying with it in the middle of the strain. And, you know, there's just a sense, and I think she agrees with this, but I think there's just a sense we're just kind of at a really high point. We've been, we've been celebrating this anniversary for a couple months. <laughs> I mean, it's big. Now, I don't know how long we're going to celebrate 50 years. I mean, we're just going to maybe take the whole year and celebrate 50. 50? <laughs> Good night. I can't even believe it's coming out of my mouth. But there's strain. There's strain in marriage but we grow through the strain. There's strain in any relationship that you have or will have that you're going to go deeply with, deep with. And because some people never grow through strain and they exit quickly when strain comes, then all of their relationships in, tend to be surface level relationships. Stay with me here. You know what I'm talking about. And so they never get to the place where they're really authentic and transparent and really share their heart and what life is going on and what life is about. And let me just tell you, that is not the kind of relationships we're called to have. God wants us to have those deep relationships where we can love one another no matter what is happening. I have some long-term friendships, uh, long-term friendships. We lived in, in Indiana and in Kansas. I've got relationships that go, that go way back. We don't have to call each other every week, every month, or even year to still feel close in relationship. I've got a buddy that loves the Indianapolis Colts that I used to, used to like when I lived there, but now I'm a, I'm a Falcons fan. All right? But when something's happening with the Colts, man, he texts me and I get that text, or he calls me, and it's like, man, we were just talking yesterday. And, and, and so I've got some relationships like that, but I've also got some relationships that are deep, that, that it's not just talking football, but I had one call me recently, a few months ago, saying, Pastor Dave, can I meet with you? So I met with him at an airport because it was that important that we flew together to be together because this wasn't something we were going to talk about over the telephone. And he told me about a failure that he had experienced. 
And because of the deep long-term friendship and relationship we had, I didn't say, oh, man, I can't believe you did that. What were you thinking? You are a moron. You are, what are you doing? I can't be, I can't be a friend with you. No. My response was, I was moved emotionally for the hurt and the pain that he was walking through. And my response was, what can I, what can I do? How can I help you? And he asked me, he invited me into his life further of how I could be that friend to walk him through the things that needed to be dealt with and to ha even help hold him accountable to some of the important things now that need to be restored to his life. And can I tell you, it's just taken us into a deeper friendship than we've ever had before. So when we love one another deeply, we don't exit the relationship when we hear bad news or we see that someone has fallen or we find out that someone has, has, has gone a, a, a direction that, that, that they shouldn't have gone there. No, we step in and we say, how can we help you recover? How can I restore you? Peter's getting really honest here, and he says, as time goes by, there's going to be some people in your circle that are going to battle sin, that are going to battle offense, and are going to have wrong behavior. But love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. And let's think about this because this is a real interesting verse and I think a really interesting phrase. I've thought about it a lot. There are two possible things that I think this may mean. Love covers a multitude of sins. And I don't think we have to choose between the two. I think maybe we can just embrace both of them. Number one. It may mean that our love can overlook their many sins. In, in Proverbs 10, 12, the writer says, love covers all wrongs. Now, here's what I think about that. When I say overlook, it doesn't mean the same thing as ignore. Overlook doesn't mean I need to exit the relationship. Overlook means that I need to stay in the relationship I can't ignore your failure or your sins, but I'm going to walk with you through this. And, and maybe, even if you're not inviting me to walk through this, through this with you, sorry, I'm in this with you. And I'm not going to stay here in this relationship and enable you to continue with this wrong behavior and this wrongdoing by just turning a blind eye to it. No, we're, I'm going to talk to you about it. I'm going to lovingly confront you about it because when I don't do that, I enable them to continue in that wrong behavior. And as a child of God, we shouldn't be enabling people to continue in their sin and continue in their wrong behavior, but we should call them into account and say, look, this isn't, this isn't what the life Jesus teaches us to live or this, this thing that's going on right now. This is a sin. This is an offense problem. This is an issue that we, we need to work on. And they may want to shut you out, but you are handling, the, handling it the right way by not enabling them to continue. No, love is willing to confront. Love is willing to hold accountable. And if we deeply love a person, we will forgive them even if they're not asking for it. We will forgive them and we show grace with them. And we move on with them. Because of love, we don't exit relationships when there are sins and offenses. We love deeply enough to see them through it. Okay, I know you're listening. Secondly, I think love covers a multitude of sins also may mean that God's love covers the multitude of our sins. This is so profoundly true. It's the wonder of grace. Sinners as you are, as I am, sinners as we are, that God still loves us in our sin, through our sin. And he loves us so much, he gave a remedy for our sin. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to meet my sin need. Amazing grace will always be my song of praise. For it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why Christ came to love me so. But he looked beyond my faults and he saw my need. That's the truth of grace. 
And God loved us that way. And if, if he was willing to love us that way, are we not as his followers to love others that way? That we are willing to look beyond the faults of others, those that, that we're in relationship with, those that we're called to love deeply and to continue to walk in relationship with them. Listen, there are times that I just can't do that well by myself. There are times that I just don't have the wherewithal to love like that. And my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That is the promise I go to. That's what I stand on when I am called to love, when I don't feel like loving and for sure they don't deserve it. And neither did you, and neither did you, and neither did you. But his grace and his love abounds in me. And so we are a community of believers that understands the love of God toward us and the love of God that flows through us so that we can walk in community and relationship together. Number three, above all, love each other deeply. So God meets our relationship needs by calling us to share our gifts by calling you to share your gifts. In this time, Christians were under such persecution by Rome that Peter writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says this in verse 9 and 10, and it's so, so important. It say, he says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Faithfully administering God's grace. You see that? In its various forms. So the first thing I want you to see right here in these two verses is this. Do not taint your gift of hospitality or whatever spiritual gift you're exercising. Do not taint it with grumbling. God gives us gifts to exercise in his kingdom for the purpose of serving and loving people. And he says, don't taint that gift with grumbling. Cindy and I have had an opportunity the last two weeks to host in our home my cousin and his wife and their four kids and their dog. The last two weeks, and there's another week plus to go. You say, whoa, what are you doing that for? Well, because, because, because they felt that God was calling them from the Denver, Colorado area to Georgia for the purpose to connect and be a part of the church at Chapel Hill and to serve God here with this church family and to, to lift up Cindy and I's hands and just be here and serve. They, you know, God speaks to people and they do things like that where they actually move from one state to another because there's a church that they feel like God's leading them to be a part of. And so, so they chose to do that. And in, in that process, the home that they chose was not going to be ready until later next week sometime. So they had a three-week period of time because they needed to get here and get four kids in school, right? So we got to get kids in school. So what do we do in the meantime? So they started looking and work. We find a place to stay for three weeks until the house is ready. So they're looking at the extended stay place. I'm saying, no, uh, not there, not in that part. Of, no, we're not going to have you stay there. Hey, we've got a couple extra bedrooms. We'll pull up, throw a mattress down on, on, in the office space, you know, Come on, come on, come, come on, come on, stay, stay at our house. And so, so we, we've done that for the last, last couple of weeks. And can I just tell you, it's been wonderful. It's been different. <laughs> we live alone, the two of us. We love living alone. <laughs> alone. Now, they're going to be in the 1 o'clock service. I'm not sure how we're going to do this in the 1 o'clock service. I'm just playing. I'm going to tell it just like this. We love living alone. But we love, we've loved it. We've loved it. God has done something in us. We've loved it. We've got another week to go. We're going to love it. We're going to love it. We're going to love it. By faith. I'm just playing. It's been great. Hospitality. We're talking about hospitality without grumbling. Now, what if we'd have been saying, man, is it about over? I mean, I can't believe that. Did you see? Did you? No. No. 
Because, because when, you, when you use your gifts that God has given you and you grumble, you know what you do? You forfeit the blessing that comes with using your gifts by grumbling at the same time you're using them. Now, can I take this a little bit further? As we use our gifts, some of you have a serving gift or a hospitality gift, and you use it right here at Chapel Hill. So I, you might be thinking, I love to use my gift. I love to serve at the doors. I'm a greeter at the doors. I love using my gift. But I don't know why they always put me over at the side door because nobody comes in the side door, maybe 20, 25 people. But I, I'm a main door type of person. I need to be at the main door. I want to use my gift at the main door. And grumble, 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 grumble. Well, I can't believe, I can't believe, I love to serve. I, God, you know I love to serve. I can't believe they scheduled me two Sundays in a row. I can't believe that I've got to serve two weeks in a row. Or, you know, Lindsay, she, she's always so smiling and happy. I can't believe she's pulled me back in the hospitality room again. You know I love to serve. You know how hospitable. I may be the most hospitable person, hospitable person in the hospitality room. In fact, they may want to name the room after me. I don't know, but, but, but I can't believe she wants me to do it again. Or, you know, I'm a hospitality room person. I am not a sign waver. I'm not a sign waver. I love, I love to greet people, but why is it getting quiet on the sign waver part? Can I keep going? I love this part. I got a gift. I got a gift of music. I love to sing. I love to sing, and I love to stand here, and I love to use my gift. And I've been through the classes, and I've been trained, and I've got this, this vocal gift. And I want to use my gift for you, Lord. I'm not sure why i got to stand all the way back here. I don't think I ought to be on the second row. I've got a front row gift. I just feel like I ought to be on the front row. I, I want to, have you seen that guy, Taylor? Have you seen his hair? I can't believe they have him up on the front row with that hair that's just like right there. It's not, he didn't even have any hair on the side. And my hair is great. And I'd love to be on the front row. And I, what are they doing? They're four, <laughs> where's Taylor at? Where's Taylor? What are you doing when, you, when you, you're forfeiting the blessing of using your gift by grumbling at the same time? And God's saying, hey, hey, I have, there's such a need for hospitality in the body of Christ. Don't, don't exercise hospitality and grumble at the same time because I want to bless you for using your gift. All right, let's keep going. Verse 10 also reminds us that the gift of hospitality is needed. Peter urges the duty of hospitality because without it, the early church could not have existed. Because here's what's happening here in that day. The traveling missionaries, the evangelists who spread the good news of the gospel, had to find some place to stay overnight. Overnight inns were very few, they were filthy, and they were notoriously immoral. So we find Peter, the man of God, lodging with a man named Simon the Tanner in Acts 10. We see Paul and his group lodging with one Manasseh of Cyprus. An early disciple in Acts 21. Now, why are these two guys even listed in Scripture? The only place we see these guys, they're listed because they offered hospitality to these men of, and women of God. Not only did the missionaries need hospitality, the local churches needed hospitality. For 200 years, the church, the church met in houses. So it required hospitality. I mean, we're having church today. Oh, hey, everybody's coming over the house. So they had to find houses that had larger rooms where people could come and gather and people would come and offer their gift of hospitality. So we read in scripture, so the church met in the house of Aquila and Priscilla in Acts, or excuse me, Romans 16. Or the church was in the house of Philemon in Philemon verse 2. And in really, it's really no different today as we are finding homes for these small gatherings that for people to come and sit in circles and so we ask for people to volunteer opening up their houses. And some of our houses have larger rooms where we can gather so people can come and sit in circles and do what we can't do in rows and engage and have interaction, get to know one another, and eventually over time begin to love each other deeply and to begin to share our, our sins and our faults and our weaknesses with one another so we can have one another encouraging, encouraging us and building us up 
And I want to celebrate those here at Chapel Hill who have done that. Over the years, you've opened your home to small groups. Some of you are opening your home this fall. In fact, if you, if you have ever opened your home to a small group or you're doing it this fall, would you just slip up your hand? And I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you. See the hands going up around people that have the gift of hospitality and saying, we lead a small group at our house. Listen. You can open your home up for a small group here at Chapel Hill, and you don't even have to lead it. You don't have to be the leader. We'll have a leader come in and lead the group, but sometimes we just need some homes that are within the area or different areas that can lead small groups. So you can use your hospitality gift and not even have to be the leader of the group. Listen, the Holy Spirit was so strong about this gift because it's so needed. The Christian, Romans 12, 13, the Christian is to be given to hospitality. 1 Timothy 3, 2, a bishop is to be given to hospitality. Titus 1.8, the bishop must be a lover of hospitality. And God will supply all of my need. According, I'm not a bishop and don't call me bishop. I'm not that. But, but I kind of feel that role here at Chapel Hill. And, and I, the Bible's telling me, God is speaking to me, be a lover of, of four kids and a dog and extra people in your house. <laughs> Love that. Be a lover of hospitality. The widows of the church lodged strangers, 1 Timothy 5.10. And it is ever to be remembered that Jesus said, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And Hebrew says, you may even entertain angels unaware by welcoming strangers into your home. Now, maybe you're opening your home or maybe you're leading a small group or maybe you're just open to connecting at a deeper level. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because that's what we need as a community of believers. So as we close today, I want to I take just a few moments and circle the wagons. In fact, I've got seven people I've asked to come and model a Chapel Hill small group with me for just a moment. So if you would go ahead and come and, and take your places in, in our home where the chairs have been set in a circle. This is the family room, and they're coming here to be seated in, in our home to, to get to know one another. And this is going to be just like it is at small groups all over the West Atlanta area and up in the Dunwoody area. In the next couple of weeks, people are going to be coming and, they're, and some of them are not going to know each other. Like right now, these people do not all know each other. So they're going to take just a moment and begin to introduce themselves to each other. And they're going to ask questions like, you know, what are your name? What's your name? What's your wife's name? What do you do for a living? What's your dog's name? How many dogs? You've got how many dogs? And you're going to, they're going to have a conversation like that. And then, of course, one of the first things you have to do, you have to do this if you're a Chapel Hill small group. You have to. You have to offer them coffee. You have to offer coffee so they will have coffee when they come into your home or come into the small group room. You have to have coffee so we have hospitality going on people are enjoying it you don't even have you in fact some of you're going to go be, and you're an introvert you you just don't even oh, it's so hard for me to do listen by faith do it anyway because it's not gonna be hard the second week it's not gonna be hard the third week but it is life changing it will transform who you are and what you do so if y'all getting to know each other just a little bit that's so good and one of the things we do after we get to know each other we we talk about the sunday message or there's a, a curriculum different groups do different things but here's one thing we all do we open our bibles and we share god's word together and so they've got a bible and we've got a leader of the group jared there that is opening the bible and and he's going to try not to spill coffee on it but he's he's got the bible open he's going to share god's word whether that's at your house or at waffle house or at the this house or Starbucks, open the Bible. You know, I think it's wonderful for people to see the Bible opened out in public and you're sharing God's word at a, at a coffee shop or at a restaurant and they're getting to know each other because you know what? They can talk all day about all kinds of stuff and you might have an interest group and you can talk about all kinds of stuff, but it is the living word of God that changes lives. So let's make sure the word of God is being spoken. Now, this next part, this is the big piece I want you to see because over time as they share openly and transparently and they just get to know each other and they start sharing needs with one another, they start talking about all the things that they're really going through, something happens in the spiritual realm. What happens in the spiritual realm is they start feeling a deep love and spiritual connection to one another. And I want them to illustrate that for you just simply by reaching over, put your coffee cups down for just a moment 
and reach over and just lock arms together. Now, we don't actually do this in small group, but this is what happens in the spiritual realm, that there's this locking of arms. And how many of you know the enemy is always trying to steal somebody and take somebody out from the community of faith? And so the enemy tries to come in and he tries to break through, but there is a bond that's been created in relationship and in prayer as they pray for one another. And as God begins to do a work in every heart and in the life of this small community, the enemy's trying to bust through the lines, but he can't get through because there's a prayer line, there's a faith line, there's a deep love and a concern and care for one another. And they form this by locking arms and locking their hearts together. And they're doing that and they're gro- loving deeply. And, and you know what? Okay, let go just for a minute. And now you are covering each other's multitude of sins. Hold hands now if you would, because you know what? Just by, just by joining a small group doesn't necessarily mean everything's now going to go right. And it doesn't mean like you're going to live right all the time. But they're going to understand when things aren't going so well for you because you've grown deeply, you've, you're loving one another deeply, and now you start binding together when things are going wrong or where there's been failure or there's been problems. So you take each other by the hand and say, let me, let me pray for you. Let me pray. And you start having someone that you can stand with who is standing with you. And that should be happening at a chapel of small group. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in small group ministry. Thank you for what, how you're going to take us to a new level, to a new place as people connect in accountable small groups. Come on, give it up for these people right here that have helped us illustrate this today. Here's what I think. Here's what I think. And by the way, thank you guys. Thank you so much. I think that our need for belonging isn't fully met until we help somebody else fully belong. Did you hear what I said? That our need for belonging and love is not fully met until we help someone else fully belong. So it's not just about you. Obviously, it's not. It's about you helping others feel connected and feel a part of that community of faith. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Because I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to us and on, on different levels, in different ways. There's been different pieces of this message that he's speaking to people. And I just want you to take a moment and say, God, what did, what did you intend me to hear, to, for me to hear? And how do you want me to walk out of here and be different? Is it in the area of having a clear mind and the voices that I'm allowing come into my life? How do you want me to live a sober and alert life? Is it about my hesitation to love people deeply because I've done that before and I was hurt? Or maybe you know that you're one who exits relationships quickly, that you don't stay in it for the long haul because when strain comes, you bail out. It's the Holy Spirit saying, no, 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 no. I want to grow you through that. I want to grow you through the strain. And that person needs you. Right now, you think that person's your enemy. Actually, that person is the person that's going to grow you to the next level of faith. And you're running from that person. You need to go and love that person. Forgive that person. Help that person feel loved and feel belonging. Love covers a multitude of sins. We're not going to keep enabling people. Maybe that's the part the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. I can't keep enabling. I love them too much to keep turning my head and not acknowledging their struggle and their sin problem. I'm going to lovingly confront them, and the Holy Spirit's going to go with you as you do that. Or maybe it's in the area of utilizing and exercising your gift. There's many of you in this room. I think God gives this gift to many people, and we don't even realize it, this hospitality gift. Just because you're not exercising, it doesn't mean you don't have it. And I think also we see in Scripture where God has just called us to be hospitable, whether we're an extrovert or not, to be hospitable for the sake of the kingdom and the sake of the gospel. What's God saying to you along this line? So Holy Spirit, speak to us. And help us to respond to you in faith. Let's take the next few moments and, be, and quietly respond to God. Our response usually sounds like this. Forgive me, Lord. Would you forgive me? Or help me. Help me. 
or maybe our response is, thank you. Thank you, Lord. And maybe today it's, Lord, enable me by your spirit to love deeper than I've ever loved before and help me to join with others in a community. Help me to be willing to circle the wagons with others. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Get connected to a small group. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Thank you for that word of encouragement. You never fully belong until you help others fully belong. That's a powerful word. Pastor Dave, Miss Cindy, thank you so much for inspiring us for 40 years too. You guys are awesome. Y'all are hashtag goals. Really, you really are. Awesome. Well, man, we're going to continue worshiping this morning by giving. And so if you've come prepared to give, we just want to say, you can go ahead and prepare your offering right now. Uh, we just want to say thank you to all you who continue to honor the Lord by bringing your tithes and offerings each week. Those who are giving your tithes, that's your first 10% of, uh, of all your increase. But also to you guys who continue to go above and beyond in your giving through our Kingdom Builders Initiative. Uh, you are changing lives all over the world and here locally from our church and in our community. And so we just want to say thank you. And as our hosts prepare to come forward with the, uh, the giving containers, we're just going to pray over our time of giving. So why don't you bow your heads with me. Father God, we thank you that you bless us to make us a blessing. We thank you that you supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus. We give you praise. We give you honor. And Lord, we just thank you for what you've done. And our giving just says thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as the hosts are passing these uh, the offering containers, once they get to the end of your aisle, you can just place that on the floor and they'll be by shortly to pick one of those up. And uh, while they're doing that, I wanna tell you uh, about a few things going on here at Chapel Hill. And so first, I wanna invite all of you young adults, raise your hand, wave at me if you're a young adult, 18, I'm not, I'm not 18, but 18 to 28, if you're a young adult, we wanna invite you next Sunday to the anchor at 7 p.m. Uh, the anchor is our young adult ministry here at Chapel Hill. And next week, we're going to have a night of worship on August uh, 26th at 7 p.m. We're also going to have Logan Ketterling. He is the young adult pastor from River Valley Church up in Minnesota. He's going to come join all of us Southerners down here to bring a great word of encouragement. He's got a relevant message for you young adults. And he's also got a heart because he is a young adult pastor. So why don't you go ahead and make your plans to come on out. And also, today is Group Link. Most of our small groups are starting, some, well, most of them are starting this week. And so we really wanna encourage you, take some time today. When you go outside these doors out in the comments, you're gonna see some people with some blue shirts or a lanyard, and it says, ask me. They are there to help you find a circle that fits your personality, your schedule, and your needs. So take a moment and stop by and talk to them. Or if you don't have time to do that today, you know what, you can go online to chapelhill.cc slash small groups to see all of the groups. We've probably got about 77 groups at all of our campuses. You can even attend another group at another campus if you see something you like there. We just wanna see you connecting in circles, just like Pastor Dave mentioned. And so we wanna help you do that, so go online. Or you know what, if you're not tech savvy, you don't have an app or anything like that, you can just call the office this week and one of our team members will be glad to help you with any of your questions and help you take that next step. So why don't you stand with me? Go ahead, stand up. And as you do, our prayer partners, they're gonna go ahead and be up here in the front. They're coming forward. And I wanna invite you, maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart during that time of prayer that Pastor Dave was praying. Maybe he's, he's, he's dealing with you on something uh, and there's just something you just need to share with one of these prayer partners. Or perhaps you wanna know more about what it means to have a relationship in Jesus Christ. And so these guys are here to pray with you. If you or if you have any needs at all, they're here to pray with you. So we invite you to come forward. If you're a guest, we wanna remind you to stop by the hospitality room. We've got that free gift. We'd love to meet you. For the rest of you, please take some time, stop by a table and talk to somebody with a blue shirt. We love you. We'll see you next weekend. Have a great week.